G'day guys, welcome back. In this video, I'm gonna be solving for you the wave equation within the context of a vibrating string. So let's cover some background first. Let's say that we have a string just here, which is taut, and let's say it's pinned at both ends just here. We describe the vertical displacement of this string as u, and in general, it's going to be a function of two variables, x and t, where x is this quantity of length and t is time. Now it turns out if you go through the maths and make some simplifications, you can show that this is true. The double partial derivative of u with respect to time is going to be equal to some constant squared times the double partial derivative of u with respect to x, where that constant is c, and that's given by this expression where t is tension and ml is your mass per unit length. Okay, that's enough background. Let's try and solve this wave equation just here. Well, the way we're gonna solve this is we're going to guess a solution to our one-dimensional wave equation. I'm going to guess if u, which is a function of both x and t, can be written in the form of some arbitrary function of just x, I'll call it phi, multiplied by some arbitrary function of time, I'm gonna call it q. So I'm gonna assume u has this form just here. And now what we need to do is we need to plug this into here and see what we get. So let's differentiate with x twice first. We know that del squared u del x squared is going to be equal to, this one will be differentiated twice, it's going to be d squared phi dx squared, and because it's just partial, this q gets left alone, like this, so that'll just be a q out there. And we know del squared u del t squared, it'll just be phi here, and d squared q dt squared here. And so this is what happens if we differentiate this expression. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to plug both of these expressions into our one dimensional wave equation and see what we get. Well, on the left hand side, we're gonna get this expression. It'll be phi times by d squared q dt squared like this. And on the right hand side, we've got this pesky c squared here. So we'll have c squared times by d squared phi dx squared times by q like this. And this expression looks pretty difficult to solve, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring all the phi's to one side and bring all the q's to one side. So let's do that. We'll have one on q times by d squared q dt squared on the left hand side and on the right hand side we'll still have that pesky c squared here but once you bring this phi underneath then we're going to have divided by phi times by d squared phi dx squared right and this expression actually says quite a lot subtly enough on the left hand side we have an expression which just consists of time and on the right hand side we have an expression which consists of just x because c is a constant so let me write this down. This right here is one giant function, function of time. And this expression on the right hand side is one giant function of x. Now if you think about it, there's no way you can get a function of time to be equal to a function of x. One involves t, one involves x. So what's the way around this? The only possible solution is they have to be equal to a constant, which I will call lambda. Lambda right here is a constant. That must be true based off this expression. Now, before I continue down this path any further, I want to take a minor detour and I want to talk about some boundary conditions just here. The left-hand edge here is fixed, which means that u of 0t, so basically this endpoint for all time, is going to be equal to 0. And u of lt, that's this right end just here, is also going to be equal to 0, right? Because it's fixed as well. And it turns out, let me just write this down, these are our boundary conditions. These are our boundary conditions. It turns out from these boundary conditions that lambda must be less than zero. Otherwise, we have a trivial solution. Now, to, to make that a little bit clearer, I'm actually going to write it down. If lambda is greater than zero, then trivial solution. And if 
lambda is equal to zero, then we also get a trivial solution, right? Now I won't actually formally spend a lot of time on the proof. If you want to see it, please pause the video now. Now I hope you're okay with me kind of shortcutting through that proof section just here. I just want to say that it's not tremendously important this part of the proof. All that's really important is I want to say that lambda must in fact be less than zero to solve for non-trivial solutions, which is what we're interested in. So lambda must be less than zero. And another way of writing that is we can say this is equal to minus omega squared, where omega is some non-zero constant, right? That's another way we can say lambda must be less than zero. Okay, so now we've got two equations we can deal with. We can deal with this left-hand side is equal to minus omega squared, and we can deal with this right-hand side is equal to minus omega squared. Let's account for these separately. Let's do the first one we'll have minus one on Q times by D squared Q DT squared is gonna be equal to minus omega squared. And then if you play around with the expression, you can say that um, D squared Q DT squared uh, plus omega squared Q is gonna be equal to zero. And we already know how to solve this um, ordinary differential equation. And if you were to go through it, I'm not gonna bore you with the mathematics, you can show that Q must in fact be equal to some arbitrary constant A times E to the J omega T plus another arbitrary constant B times E to the minus G omega T. I won't bore you with the steps here. I'm pretty sure you all know how to get from here to here. But what's really important is we can actually expand this out using Euler's formula. And we can actually write this in a different way. We can write Q is equal to a different arbitrary constant. I'll just call it lowercase a times by cosine omega t plus another arbitrary constant, I'll just call it lowercase b, times by sine omega t, where a and b are just potentially complex constants. And this is good. We've now got an expression for q. Now let's find an expression for phi by doing a similar thing. We know that c squared on phi times by d squared phi dx squared is equal to minus omega squared just here. And now if you play around with the algebra, you can show that d squared phi dx squared plus omega squared on c squared times phi must be equal to zero. And we can solve this in a very similar way as we solved the last one. And we can tell that phi is going to be equal to some constant, I'll call it c, capital C, times by e to the j omega on cx plus d times e to the minus j omega on cx, like this. And we can expand this out or using Euler's formula and write this in a different way. We can write this as phi is equal to some other constant, I'll call it lowercase c this time, times by cosine omega on cx plus another arbitrary constant times by sine omega on c x like this. And this is good. This means we now have an expression for phi and an expression for q, which both satisfy the wave equation just here. This is great news. We're, we're doing really good. And now let me scroll down a bit so I can write down the value of u u is just q times by phi, so let me write that down bit for bit. It's going to be a times by cosine omega t plus b sine omega t like this. And phi is just here, so we can write this as c cosine omega on cx, but I'm just gonna write that as kx like this, plus d times by sine kx like that. Now, you may have noticed, um, I've instead of writing omega on c, I've just written k just here. That's because k is equal to omega on c, and we call this something special. We call this the wave number, like that, okay? And so we now have a generalized expression for u, but we're not completely done yet. What I also want to do is I want to actually plug in our boundary conditions so that we can get a more simplified um, expression for our equation of motion. Well, if we plug in our first boundary condition, I'll call that our first boundary condition and our second boundary condition just here, what do we get? 
Well, on the left-hand side, we will have 0. And on our right-hand side, we will have um, Q just as it is. It's going to be A cosine omega t plus B sine omega t, like that. And on this side, what will happen when x equals 0? Well, we're going to have, this will turn to 1 and this will turn to 0. So we're just going to have C just here, right? This turns to 1, this turns to 0, so we just have C. Which means that we're left with two possible solutions. Either C can be 0, or this guy must be equal to 0. Now, if Q is 0, that would mean that we have a trivial solution, because that would imply that U is equal to 0 for all time. So that means that C must be 0. So C must be equal to zero to solve for non-trivial solutions. That's important. Now let's plug in our second boundary condition. Well, if we do that, we've got zero on the left-hand side, and then we've got our same Q value. It's gonna be A cosine omega t plus B sine omega t like this. And then what will we have here? Well, we know c is equal to zero, so that means we just have this term. It's going to be d times by sine kx, but x is equal to l in this case, so it's gonna be kl like that. And so this leaves us with three possibilities. Either this term must be zero, or d must be zero, or sine kl must be zero. Now, we know this term can't be zero because that leads to a trivial solution. But if d is equal to zero, that would mean that both c and d are zero, which means that phi is equal to zero, which means that u is equal to zero, which is also trivial. Which means that our only way to get non-trivial solutions is if sine kl must be equal to zero. This is a consequence of our boundary conditions. Sine kl must be equal to zero. And you might know how to solve this, we know that the, the argument of this sine function must be equal to n pi. So what this implies is kl must be equal to n pi, where n is just some integer, n is just some integer 1, 2, 3, etc, etc. And now let's pause here and think about what this expression really says. It says that there are actually an infinite number of wave numbers that satisfy this wave equation expression just here with our boundary conditions. It means that one possible value of k, which, which can solve the wave equation, is k subscript 1 is going to be equal to 1 pi on L. Another wave number which could satisfy it is k2, which will be 2 pi on L. And another one would be 3 pi on L, for example. So there are an infinite number of wave numbers which satisfy our wave equation with these boundary conditions. And by consequence of this expression, it also means there are an infinite number of natural frequencies. Omega is just c times by k. So one value of omega, which satisfies this wave equation, is um, 1 pi c on L. Another one would be omega 2, which is our, another natural frequency, would, which would be 2 pi c on L. Another one would be 3 pi c on L, for example. Right, so there are an infinite number of natural frequencies and wave numbers which satisfy our wave equation with these boundary conditions. Okay, so we've established there are an infinite number of solutions. Let's write down a few of those solutions now. We know that one of these solutions, which I'll denote with the subscript 1 just here, is when omega is equal to omega 1 and k is equal to k subscript 1. And that'll yield a times by cosine omega 1t plus b times by sine omega 1t times by, let's see, I could start writing c, but we know c is equal to zero. So that's going to be d times by sine k1x like that. This is one possible solution to the wave equation. And here are another few solutions to the wave equation, u2 and u3. Aha, and so these are three possible solutions to the wave equation just here. And to distinguish them, we should actually put subscripts here as well, like this. Like that, because the constants themselves can be different too. Now, each of these specific solutions are called modes of vibration. This is the first mode, second mode, third mode, etc. But what's the general solution? Where's the meat of this? 
Well, let me actually write that down for you. What we need to do to get the general solution, and this is the last step, is we need to apply the superposition theorem. And so what this states is that the general solution will be the infinite sum of every mode of vibration, u1 plus u2 plus u3 plus u4, etc, etc, etc. So u, which is a function of x and t, let me make it formal, u is going to be the infinite sum of this. So it's going to be the sum from n is equal to 1 to n is equal to infinity of everything here. And let me actually generalize a little bit further. It's going to be... Um, if we bring, if we group the D's and A's together in each one of these expressions, we're just going to have some arbitrary constant, I'll just call it A subscript N, times by cosine omega NT, plus, and if we bring the B's and D's together, we can write this as B times, B subscript N times by sine omega N T like this, and we're timesing that all by sine k n x just here this is our general solution to the wave equation with the boundary conditions that i stated earlier this is it guys this is the final amazing result and let me clarify that k n was given by this expression so k n is just going to be equal to n pi on l and we defined it earlier as and let me scroll it up so you can see we defined it earlier as omega n on c just here, omega n on c, like that. Wonderful. So we have our general equation of motion just here for our string. Now before we're in this video, and I realize it's been a long one, I just want to hammer down a few extra things. A n and b n can be found from our initial conditions. Also, based off this equation, we can tell that the generalized equation of motion is an infinite sum of cosine and sine waves at different wave numbers and corresponding natural frequencies. And that's a theme that holds true in all continuous systems. Okay guys, I hope that proof wasn't too involved and I hope you really learned something. Cheers.